Good afternoon. I'm Rob Park from Nuclear for Climate Australia. This afternoon, I'd like to speak to you about the reality of Australia's projected nuclear energy costs. <clears throat> but first off, we're going to look at two major announcements that have been made internationally over energy over the last three days or so. The first last Sunday was China's nuclear power surge, where their administration announced that 10 new nuclear power plants had been approved for the investment of 41.1 billion Australian dollars. And it was stated that China's nuclear energy development is entering a new strategic opportunity period, said Yang Chengli, the chairman of the Chinese Nuclear Energy Agency. By 2030, <clears throat> installed capacity of operational nuclear power is expected to reach 110 gigawatts. Nuclear power will play a vital role as a key substitute for high carbon energy sources, for example, coal, and a mainstay for the stability of the new power system. So while China is building a lot of wind and solar, they fully recognise that you have to have baseload ultra low carbon energy as the main, mainstay to keep the system stable. China now has 102 nuclear reactors either operating, under construction or approved. Together, they represent installed capacity of 113 gigawatts to be completed shortly after 2030. That makes it the largest nuclear fleet in the world. They have now gone past the United States for the largest fleet, but they've also now got some of the most advanced reactors being built. The second unfortunate announcement was that <clears throat> of the power outage in the Iberian Peninsula, which affected 60 million people in Spain and in Portugal primarily. This involved an unexplained oscillation, or if you like, variation in the frequency and voltage that was occurring within the grid. Apparently, it started in the southern part of Spain. And to ensure that the systems remained protected, they sequentially shut down, turning the entire area into a blackout. There's been a lot of speculation as to what, how this occurred. But Leon Hirth, an energy consultant and professor in energy policy at the Hertie School in Berlin, said it was likely that a system with very little conventional generation, namely nuclear, gas, coal or hydro, has less dampening inertia. In other words, is more prone to some such oscillations getting out of control. So despite the uncertainty, he said, I think it is fair to say that it didn't help that the Iberian system was mostly running on wind and solar on Monday at noon. This oscillation that occurred in the Iberian Peninsula was fortunately halted in expanding into the larger European grid by the massive rotational inertia built in to the French nuclear power system. It protected the rest of the European grid from the impacts of the Iberian blackout. But unfortunately, there were also victims in that blackout. 60 billion people, massively inconvenienced, massive cost to, in to industry. But unfortunately, three elderly people died when they used a domestic electricity generator to try to power an oxygen mask and they died of carbon monoxide poisoning. And a woman, unfortunately, died in Madrid when she caused a fire with a candle that she was using to get light because there was no light within the home. Commuters were stuck in trains. Some 13 trains, major interconnecting trains were caught. People had to be evacuated and rail corridors had to be cleared of these people. It's been a massive problem. But unfortunately, here in Australia, we have Spanish renewable energy contractors coming into this country, 
and making a lot of money out of our subsidised systems on the back of the energy havoc that they've created back home in Spain. We need to get on top of this and change the direction of Australia's future energy transition. We cannot have the type of havoc occurring in Australia, which has happened in Spain. But getting in the way of a fair-minded, objective analysis of how we handle our energy transition has been the Australian Labor Party and what I call their anti-climate action allies, such as the Climate Council or Climate 200 or some of the Teals. These people are wedded ideologically to renewables. They do not look objectively at our options and they do not look at the safety for our grid. So let's look at the kinds of costs that we could reasonably expect for nuclear in Australia. What I'm saying is that most plants would cost in the region of $9 to $12 billion per unit. The ALP are claiming this $600 billion figure that has been dreamt up, and that would convert to about $46 billion per unit. So I look at some of the plants we could have. They're proven track records. These are not dreams. We've got the South Korean APR 1400s. They're the current mainstay, the current plant that's being built in South Korea, the plants that were built at the Barraca plants in the United Arab Emirates. They would cost about $12 billion a unit. Or their smaller cousin, the AP1000, APR1000. <clears throat> that was the mainstay traditionally of the South Korean plants. They cost just under $12 billion. Within Australia, some of our sites will be a bit constrained and we need to be looking at even smaller plants. And we have the Canadian Candu EC6. We could combine with our Canadian cousins and build these 740 megawatt units at about just over 9 billion a unit. Or their larger Canadian Monarch reactor, again about a one gigawatt plant for about 10 and a half billion. Contrast those costs with what we're currently seeing with the recent announcement in China with their HPR 1000. They're costing about 4 billion, or about a third the cost of the equivalent types of plants coming out of Korea, Canada. <clears throat> One of the world's largest exporters of nuclear power plants, of course, is Russia. They're building plants in Bangladesh, they're building them in Turkey, and they're building them in Egypt. And their VVR 1200s are generally costing a grain, around about the $10 billion per unit. Within the United States, MIT have looked closely at the future costs of a fleet of AP1000, that's the Westinghouse plants, again, they would be looking at around about the $10 billion, $9.8 billion per unit. Contrast that with these callous, indifferent claims made by the ALP that they will cost $46 billion a unit. These people do not care about having ultra-low emissions, ultra-low-cost low energy in Australia. I used to be an endorsed ALP candidate, but I left that party when I realised that really, at their heart, is neither the environment nor low-cost energy was at the heart of ALP policy. All they cared about was winning at any cost. So let's look at the Coalition's current policies. It's not perfect, and we'll go into some of the issues. They're proposing seven plants, two in Queensland at Calide and Tarong, two plants in New South Wales at Liddell and Mount Piper, one in Victoria at Luoyang, one in South Australia at Northern at the top of the Gulf, and one in Mooja in Western Australia. <clears throat> what sort of reactors would be suited to the Coalition's plan? Well, initially, Peter Dutton and Ted O'Brien 
stated that they weren't actually going to announce the size of the plants to be built at each site. They preferred, quite sensibly, to stay with the examination of the hydrology resources for cooling, the seismic issues, the grid connection, and other factors related to siting of nuclear power plants. But then frontier economics came onto the scene, and so clearly more meat had to be put on the bones of this policy. Along the way, therefore, the coalition's policy came under more scrutiny with respect to things such as curling or things such as seismic activity. So at Nuclear for Climate Australia, we've had a look at trying to put the types of plants that we consider would rationally fit within the coalition's policy. These are plants that currently exist. At the two sites in Queensland, Callard and Tarong, they are water-constrained sites, and we don't think the plants bigger than the existing coal plants really are sensible at this stage until more analysis is done. And so we consider there two can-do EC6s as each of those sites would work quite well. But likewise at Mount Piper, again, the shared cooling resource there between Mount Piper and the Arwal Arrowing sites would probably serve two can-do plants. At Liddell, where the cooling facilities served by the Hunter River are much greater, we could put two, uh, could three of the South Korean APR 1000s. Five of those could go in at Loyang because there is a much larger existing cooling resource that ser served Loyang, Hazelwood, and also the Yulon. And in Northern Power Station side in uh, South Australia, we could also consider two of those plants particularly because of the large industrial demand to the north of that state. Total cost for these plants would be about $157 billion, that's for the NEM. And if you add in the two that could be built at Nuja in Western Australia, you get up to about $174 billion for the lot. So if we now translate those sorts of costs to some modelling, in this graph, I'm showing <clears throat> in blue the capital costs of three different plants. The one on the left is AEMO's progressive change. The one in the centre is the coalition's plan, and the one in the on the right is the nuclear for climate's plan. And what we've done here is we've costed out the capital for each energy system between 2030 through to 2090, 60 years over the life of a nuclear power plant. And we've also assumed we've normalised them by all at 277 terawatt hours per year. So there's no dispute over one being putting out more than the other. <clears throat> AMO's progressive change we consider will cost $955 billion, exclusive of transmission and distribution. The coalition's plan we consider will cost about $799 billion. The nuclear component on the NEM is $158 billion. And again, no transmission or distribution is sitting in that, but there is quite a bit of residual wind and solar. On the right-hand side, Nuclear for Climate's plan will cost $592 billion, but the nuclear component is much higher at about $330 billion. And we'll explain that in the next slide. <clears throat> because the more nuclear put in to these plans, it improves costs and emissions. Again, on the left-hand side, we see AMO's progressive change we consider the cost for that at about 52 cents per kilowatt hour. The coalition's plan, we consider it's got about 41% nuclear and at about 48 cents, it's still got a lot of renewables and storage, which is driving up its cost. On the right-hand side, 
we've stripped the renewables down to about the level that we currently have in Australia. We've removed a lot of the renewables, of the storage, and we've driven the nuclear component up to about 75%. And that gives us a cost down around 34.3 cents, primarily because there's less storage, less transmission and less distribution. But look at where the, the emissions fall. With progressive change, because of the large amount of renewables in it and the large gas component, it's at about 150 grams of carbon per kilowatt hour. Coalition's plan halves that to about 79. And we've got about a quarter or less than a quarter under nuclear for climate's plan and about 34 grams of carbon per kilowatt hour. The dotted red line shows the emissions if we only consider the burned carbon amounts and the nuclear for climate proposal totally limits fossil fuels. So in summary, we need to do a much better job in reporting the costs of nuclear energy. The coalition's plan is a way to get us underway with ultra low cost energy system and ultra low emissions. And we need to be voting this coming Saturday to get rid of the anti-nuclear legislation by voting for the coalition. Thank you.